Hi and welcome back to another video of JPlay. I am Marcus and I'm finally back in my studio in my basement playing an actual cardboard version of a board game. And yes, as you can see, it's Masters of the Universe Fields of Eternia, the board game. Yes, that's quite a mouthful. I got this game from a or basically through my friendly local game store, T3 in Frankfurt. And I didn't really get into the original campaign, can't quite remember if it was Kickstarter or GameFound, doesn't really matter too much. I don't really know what it was. Maybe it was to show on Netflix, which kind of disappointed me. But anyway, I got myself a copy here. Unfortunately, now I only have basically the base game, the retail version of the game. Still, it comes with a decent amount of stuff. And I brought it to a game night, so we really arranged a session and a friend came by who usually doesn't come anymore because he's very busy but he really wanted to play Masters of the Universe with us and we played a four-player game and actually everyone liked it including myself so I kind of regret not getting into the Kickstarter or again the game for whatever it was so let's see if I get a chance to get at least some of the stuff I, I believe some of the expansion the big boxes you can get for retail as well so you get the extra factions and whatnot which will then also hopefully introduce some more encounters some more scenarios and whatnot but I think you can play this game um, for quite a while and be happy and yes as it so happens it also comes with a lot of game modes actually so the normal mode is really a team game so one versus one team versus others you always play three in a base game so three heroes per team and that's the same for the solo yeah maybe co-op game it's not really a solo game because you also have to control three heroes and that's what I'm doing today I haven't played the solo game or the cooperation before but I think I have a good handle on the multiplayer game and the differences are subtle the combat is definitely completely changed so this is where I'm most likely going to mess things up but apart from that I should be okay and ultimately I'm going to play as man-at-arms Tila and Stratos Originally, I was going to play with Shira instead of Stratos, but because of his movement abilities, I think that this might become crucial in this game or in this scenario. Let's see how things go. I really like Shira, but I think from a gaming aspect, for today, I'm preferring Stratos, but just because of his special ability down here. As for the scenario, we are going to play He-Man Imposter, which is also the main reason why you don't see He-Man in the original lineup here. So we might have to fight him later on if we make it that far. <laughs> Let's put it like this. Created by Man-at-Arms, Faker was built as a decoy of He-Man, approximating him in both appearance and strength. However, Faker was salvaged and reprogrammed by the evil forces of Skeletor and sent to the royal palace to impersonate He-Man. With his new blue skin, Faker looked like a member of the Gar race, enemy of the people of Eternia, which led many to believe that their beloved hero, He-Man, had turned to evil. With the real He-Man away on an important mission, the remaining masters of the universe must find Faker and stop Skeletor's evil blood. So right now, neither Skeletor nor He-Man are on the board. In order to bring Faker out, we have to basically defeat Skeletor first. The first time we are defeating Skeletor, Faker will automatically appear. But there are also some events throughout the game, which will also drive the story when um, he will basically appear and then will march, uh, make his march toward Castle Greyskull here. And whenever he makes it there, we have automatically lost the scenario. If we somehow manage to keep him away and go through the full distance, I believe that's round 12. We can also consider this a win and then we will tally up our score in the end. I don't really know if the scenario is, let's call it, balance so that you either have to win or lose so I really don't know if there is a chance actually that I can make it to the end of this space without engaging Faker or so I really don't know I haven't counted things through but I will let myself surprise myself is that right I don't know let's see how things go there is one last thing I need to set up I just found out and that's around those quest tokens here in this scenario I think 
think whatever we have, we have in other multiplayer scenarios. I think the game only comes with two multiplayer scenarios, unfortunately. Um, unless you are going for a skirmish scenario, that is another mode of playing this game. Um, but yeah, um, we, we will start the game with, I think, quite a few of these quest encounters here. Uh, but there will never be any new quest encounters unless there are some events here in the encounters also that might change it. I can't quite remember. So yeah, let me finalize the setup and then I think we should be pretty much ready to go. Okay, I have placed all the quest counters in here. One is actually relatively nearby of our heroes. Right now, all our heroes have a movement of one other than Stratos who can spend some money, basically Eternium, to gain one extra movement and flying until the end of the turn. So in theory, he already could make it to this quest counter here. The problem really is having a quest counter um, or having a quest encounter, one of these ones here from the Fractures in Time stacks, what we are using for these solo modes here. Again, the game comes with two decks for the two multiplayer scenarios. Um, I think it's pretty tough early on to be. There are some that are very easy and very situational, but if you are um, engaging an epic creature, an epic beast, then you're pretty much out of luck. So one of the first things that we may want to do, and maybe I should have mentioned, I'm playing on the novice difficulty level, which is not the lowest one. On the lowest level, we would already have started with some soldiers in these locations here, which would allow me to negotiate with the traders there. So I think one of the first things that we do want to, want to make is to yeah gather the controls of these merchants here. These are outposts, by the way, these ward areas, and these are wild spaces. So in order to really get income, in order to whatever, be able to trade with merchants, again, these are merchant spaces down here, and we need to occupy them, we need to control them. We, we either do that through a hero that is there, or we can also place soldiers into those territories. So I think we will start with Stratos. We get to choose the order of how we are activating those heroes. And I'm playing basically with metal money here. The Eternium tokens that come with the game are basically a shame. I don't really like them a lot. <laughs> okay, bear with me. So we are spending um, pretty much one coin, which is... It's not nothing in this game. Let's put it like this. To activate Stratos' ability, flight when declaring a move action, that's what we are doing right now. Stratos may spend one Eternium, which we just did, to gain plus one movement and flying until the end of the turn. Flying is not so much of an issue right now, but we need the two movement points in order to make it to one of those. And right now, I'm somewhat tempted to go for a Spell merchant here at Grayskull Tower because spells can be increased. Are these spells? Actually, no, these are not spells. What am I talking about? Spells are down here at Elder's Village. This is a symbol for a spell, I believe, up there. Oh no! <laughs> symbol is basically a fast travel point. Sorry for that. But still, um, it's still two movement points to get there. Normally, I would not be able to move there. There are two ways of moving in this game. And I think this is the most often asked question on the geek. Um, how does it work between outpost and normal movement? You can move between those outposts basically through these direct lines here, these dotted lines that you see here, but therefore you need to control them both uh, in order to um, use that. Right now we are not controlling any outposts other than Castle Grayskull, so yeah, that's not a point. All the more reason to, uh, no, it doesn't help us, no, it doesn't. But I still think I want some spells because the spells we can use anywhere. That's the thing. Let's do that. So we have spent our money. We are initiating a move action, one and two into Elder's village. The first thing that will happen now, because we are controlling a space with a merchant, there are no enemies whatsoever, so we are not triggering a fight, is that we are revealing four spells, which are now on public display. It's a common pool for these merchants. So in a multiplayer game, also in a team game, everyone would be able to acquire them. And 
unless you don't have access to a merchant or so that's really one of the crucial first things that you need to do in this game um, but yeah we can buy those in the solo game I think there is no rule that is taking things away from me so they're all here for my entertainment alone and at the end of each hero's turn you are able then to negotiate or trade with those merchants no matter where you are located on the map as long as you control that merchant you can buy from that merchant wherever you are you don't have to move to them or so which makes let's say this whole trading mechanic much quicker compared to games like Roombound 3rd edition where you really have to spend an awful lot of time moving to those merchants in order to really get the cool gear. But in this case we have the Revival, the Surge, the Counter-Attack and the Thunder. Mm -hmm. That's a very nice card here if we are getting attacked. Search is also nice. We have to keep in mind. This is also cool. The revival play during the preparation phase gain one until the end of this hero's activation can be pretty helpful. It's not awfully expensive. And the thunder deal two damage to an enemy soldier or one damage to two soldiers or deal two damage to an enemy hero. This can be a very cool end game spell but it could also help us in getting Skeletor out. Because in order to lure Skeletor out, we have to defeat both Beastmen and Triclops here at least once. When you defeat them, they go back to the Temple of Serpos and will try to make it back to their starting locations. But once you have defeated them both at least once, this will then make um, Skeletor's appearance. Um, but again, He-Man or the Faker is a little bit independent yes in theory you want to also get rid of him as soon as possible um, because I think you want to move towards him and you might maybe make might take you some time and they're not really actively healing so also something that you need to keep in mind so I think this thunder could be a cool thing on the other hand the counter attack could help us as well during epic combats against beasts for example and getting those beast encounters will also give you some better things. No I think uh, this is an end game card and no one is getting taking this away from me right that's the idea. Yeah yeah we will do that but I think we still have an action we only moved once and buying or purchasing cards is something that you do at the very end of your turn simply to speed things up a little bit. It was a bit problematic actually this rule I get it why they did it but in some instances mm, you have to wait to see what they are actually buying what kind of equipment and so on because um, this very same hero that is about to buy something might be buying something that would then maybe make me not want to attack him with my next action for example so very often if you are at least nearby you still have to wait and see what they are picking so yeah that's that's that so but still uh, stratos still has one more action left and i think he is going to mobilize soldiers here in elders village in a normal game multiplayer game you would absolutely mobilize three soldiers you can mobilize up to three soldiers in an outpost and this is also the cap for these villages here um, for friendly soldiers that it I think in this very scenario one is enough because no one is going after my soldiers here at least that's what I think we still want to have stronger outposts a little bit later but that's more when we are moving towards beastmen here or triclops at Mount Eternium because um, these soldiers will help us yeah defeating them for example. So right now they are protected by these fellas to some extent and if we are moving soldiers in there we can somewhat reduce that um, basically amount of resistance that is. Okay but those were the two actions of Stratos. Now he is buying a spell and I think the idea was to go for counter-attack. We are paying three Eternium for those. We put this next to Stratos and the way how these spells work you can use them from anywhere on the map so you don't whatever even if they are miles apart Stratos can still cast this spell for an encounter that Tila is in for example that's why these spells are extremely powerful at times. 
Before we forget, let's reveal a new spell. There will always be four spells available, but only after you have purchased the spell. So they're not auto refilling right away. Here's Berserk, draw in place. Wow, that's an amazing card as well. But it costs four, of course. Getting an additional combat card that can be huge. Combat breaking huge, really, that, that can make a big difference. Awesome, definitely something to keep in mind. And I will have to keep these spells a little bit away from my normal gaming space because of table real estate. The game board is pretty massive, actually. But okay, that was his turn. In a multiplayer game, the other faction would now activate their first hero. But as we are playing alone, we will activate them all. And I think we want to activate Men at Arms next. His Special ability, Tactical Genius, allows him, while any friendly heroes are in the same area or an adjacent area to this hero, they gain plus two mind, which can be also pretty handy, actually, especially during these epic combats, um, which is why for now we have to keep him nearby anyway. Mm, and for him him we also want to move him closer to one of these two merchants either folk castle or village of gas i think it doesn't really matter too much so we will move him basically in between those so we can still make a call later on unless we are saying no but we can move her here as well right doesn't really matter from there they have to move in here so now i think that makes sense so we are initiating a move action and for the second action, I think we are going to brave the wilds, which you can do in a wild space. No surprise here. And this is the way how you are dealing with a somewhat more normal encounter. So not going for these quest markers here. You can pay one Eternium in order to draw two cards and pick one. And I think early game that this might be really important actually. So we are spending the one Eternium here to draw one and two cards. Interestingly enough, we have drawn two events. I was hoping for an ally, but yeah, we weren't lucky. The Strange Hermit, which would give us a special combat card. Getting combat cards early on in the game could be quite huge, actually. Which one is this? Ah, oh, yeah, it's this one down here. Can't quite remember. We have one of those in our deck at least once, and they simply give us one extra combat point, which is good. It doesn't count for a two card limit per combat row. I will explain you all these things when we come to our first epic encounter, and we can immediately draw and replace another combat card. So that's a really cool card and could help us making our deck a little bit better because for every combat card you're adding to your combat deck, and that's a faction combat deck, similar to Gloomhaven here to some extent, we could remove, for example, a standard one and replace it for this right off the bat. That's not, yeah, that's tempting. And this one here, the hidden treasure, is simply a money-making thing. So here we could spend four, five Eternium, which we still have. We still have five Eternium to really automatically... I think that's something we should do. I really do think that's something we should do. Getting money could be nice, but I would roll the die actually in this scenario here. So no, 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 no. We will... We want to strengthen our combat deck as early as possible. So let's see, a hermit offers training in exchange for an item stolen by rogue. Would you like to take advantage of this offer? Your affection may do one of the following to gain a uh, whatever card. Spend five Eternium, which we still have, or each hero must discard each hero. Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have any equipment card. We have one spell card, but we would have to do that for each hero right now. So if only one, then I would totally give this away. But I think in this case, let's spend the money. Why not? We don't have an awful lot of things right now anyway. And I think strengthening our combat deck early on could be extremely huge. So we will take this combat deck and we always have to replace. So the, the um, size of this deck never changes. So we are simply taking one of those guys out we'll put this one in we will shuffle it and now we have somewhat somewhat strengthened our combat deck yeah i like that 
Okay, that was Men at Arms. He moved and then he braved the wild. So we are coming to Tila. And by the way, I think that activating all the heroes now um, on one side is very special to this scenario. I really haven't looked at the other scenario quite honestly, but they are only activating in very certain circumstances. Once Skeletor is out, he's definitely moving towards us. Um, the same is true for, for Faker, for example, and if we have defeated Triclops or Beastman. But apart from that, they're really not doing an awful lot as far as I understood. They really want to hold their outpost, basically. But anyway, we are moving to Tila. Her special power is acrobatic. When Tila enters an area with one or more enemy models or vice versa, roll a die, you may move to an adjacent. So she can, she's basically a little bit more evasive, which can be extremely helpful if you want to move places and don't want to stop somewhere. So this can be extremely powerful. And I think for her, we will do something very similar. The question is, do we want... Yeah, I think we need, we want these two uh, merchants at least during the next round. We don't have any, a lot of money actually, and we will not get an awful lot. Yeah, we will get some money back. So that's not too bad. So I think we are simply moving her down here. She's still adjacent to men at arms. If it ever matters, or maybe, no, let's, let's move her here actually, because if he's moving, um, he would still be adjacent to her. Yeah, I think that's the better deal. So this was her movement. And then we are also braving the wilds with her, unfortunately out of money, which means we have to draw a card and have to resolve it no matter what. Oof. And again, we are facing an event. I really shuffled the heck out of this deck. Unguarded Wyvern's Nest. Wyvern eggs can fetch a high price. You could steal an egg for yourself or protect the nest from nearby predators. Act quickly. Okay. What are our chances? You really have, you are allowed to read all through these effects. So we can steal them. Keep this card in front of you when you reach. We are moving towards a merchant action. This would give us some liquidity. Mm, tempting, tempting. Or protect. Reveal cards from the scenario deck until an epic beast is revealed. Resolve an epic combat against it. Oh wow, we would gain another combat card. But uh, we are not in a position right now to make it through an epic combat. I, I know that from the multiplayer game, some of us tried that early on and it's simply a waste of time. So no, we are not going to do that. So we will keep hold on to this card. Yes, some of you might be terrified by this, but I think getting some money back and that's exactly where we are moving to right now. That's her location to move to. Um, yeah, I think that's that's too much, too, too, too promising right now. So we will hold on to this card, but this is already her turn done basically. Now our enemies would activate and in the from the normal solo mode rules is if there would be now a controlled outpost reach with less than three of these soldiers we would add one soldier each but again there is a cap of three of these soldiers in any of these outposts so that's not going to happen here. They only want to hold their outposts so they're right now also not moving away. Similarly Skeletor hasn't appeared neither has Faker so we are basically moving into the next round which is a night round and at the end of a night round each hero gets to heal basically one piece of damage i think this happens after their individual activations the next space would be already an event space where we could lose oh that's the point oh okay i didn't think this one through would you allow me this one, Mulligan? Because this first event, you know, you have to know these events. If we are triggering this event, we are rolling a die for each hero, I believe. And for every success we are rolling, we are removing one soldier. And again, we want to hold on to these guys. Again, you know these things. And I was thinking about there is nothing really that removes those, but of course there are those events. So sorry for taking things back, but yeah, I think this is really important. So we will add two more soldiers to that outpost simply to suck up some damage here. Sorry for that. But that's basically, yeah, we are moving into the next round of the game. This time we are going to start with 
Tila, she's moving into this. So now we are controlling that area. We are trading in those uh, Wyverns Axe for three Eternium. So at least we have some money and we might be able to use that money on Stratos again. I think that's that's this is what I really like about this game, this whole tactical strategic approach that you get to choose who is going first, who is going next. And based on your decisions, you can really influence the game state to some extent, but nicely done. So we have traded in our Wyverns X. Then we will draw because we are controlling it four of those. Uh, these are now really equipment cards. So let's see what we get. Battle Armor 2, Steel Gauntlets, plus one body or strength or whatever it is. In Epic and Wilds Combat, this hero loses one less. During each attack resolution, that's very powerful. The plate armor is simply one defense, also not bad. And then we have the Preternium Talisman. Whenever rolling dice, this hero may roll up to two dice, but only once per die. Oh, nice, only once per die. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, these are all pretty tasty. The only, oh, we can't afford both of those, actually. It's something we have to think about, but we still have Tila's and her second action. And I think she will also mobilize, but now I'm relatively certain I will only bring out two soldiers here. Again, right now they're only meat shields, and when this first event is triggered relatively soon, yeah, even if you're rolling three successes, we are good. We could even go... No, I think we need exactly five in order to still control these regions without having a hero present. Exactly. But that's basically her action already. So we are flipping this to the other side. Next, it would be Man at Arms, I believe. And it might seem boring, but that's what you need to do early on in this game. We are moving toward this merchant over here, Faux Castle. This will reveal four vehicles, and those can be awfully expensive. The Dragon Walker had this as a miniature. Miniature is really, it was really a massive thing. I don't know, it was 30 centimeters or so. It was really cool. I love this one a lot, actually. Ice Robot 8. Uh, the Ice Raider is nice. Um, also a little bit depending on luck. At the start of the hero's turn, you have to roll a die, then you get something out of this. The Plaster Hawk gain plus two during each combat round of Apple. Oh, this is really such an amazing vehicle, actually. And we are gaining one defense against melee weapons. Ah, these are all so nice, but right now we don't really have the money for that. And by the way, I decided not to buy anything for Tila. Now I have seen this offer, so no, I think I will not take it. But I think right now there is no real rush, actually. So yeah, let's do that for now. We will keep it here. And also for his second action, we are simply, let's also add two soldiers in there, I guess, for now, so that we can keep control even if we are moving out of that area. Again, if we are losing control of these, we are no longer able to trade with those merchants. And by the way, I also should have mentioned this little Eternium um, icon here that simply is an income that we will get at the start of the next round by the way so we will definitely get some more money back all the more reason now to consider spending one Eternium to move Stratos into Talox city um, for one more income yet it's one versus one but we will get that money basically throughout that game so that's definitely important enough so yeah, I think you have to spend money to make money, right? So we are spending one in order to trigger his ability. He is moving one and two into Tarlock City. This is not a uh, basically trader space, so we are not adding. And even if you're controlling more traders, you're not adding more cards, but you're getting more discounts on those items. So that can also help. Uh, we also want to control this, and I think now it's the First time actually to consider, yeah, let's place three in here. So we are mobilizing again. And later on, there is also another option. Um, so basically when you do a mobilized soldier action, you can either uh, yeah, basically levy those troops or you can move them along those outpost lines here. So if Stratos is in the same space or adjacent to a space with their own soldiers, he could then 
command them to move over here, for example, to preserve a cast, but always moving over these outposts. And soldiers, as far as I understood, and that's also some of the questions here um, that I saw on the Geek but I'm relatively sure that's what it is. You're, they are only moving from outpost to outpost. So you typically shouldn't find a soldier in these wild regions. But yeah, these were basically all our heroes activated. So the round is again done. So we are really speeding through this game. And the longer we need, the closer we come to this third event here, where Faker will actually appear, independent if we have defeated Skeletor or not. And again, I'm not sure if that's a problem or not. Um, we know where he will appear, and that's up here in the caverns of Rakash. And from there, he will then move one, one, two, three, four spaces into Castle Greyskull. And I think I somewhat explained you this, I think wrongly in some way. Um, because it's not as soon as he's moving into Castle Greyskull have we lost. The event down here says when this is happening and then when he's entering that Castle Greyskull, then we have basically lost the scenario. But I'm relatively certain that this will happen basically hand in hand. Again, I'm not buying anything for those fellas right now with two money. I think we want to hold on to those. We are moving into the third round. Now we have basically two things to consider. I'm not 100% sure what happens first, but in this case it doesn't really matter. We will simply go from top down to bottom. So first of all, we will trigger this event, which says heroes ambushed, roll a die. For each success, remove a friendly soldier from the map, prioritizing locations with a merchant first. And that's the main reason why I really thought we need some more stronger defenses at those merchant locations. And Again, I do think that this is true for each of the heroes. Roll a die, because otherwise it's one soldier. It really wouldn't matter at all. No, I think we have to roll that die per hero. So let's see. We will simply start here with man at arms. We are rolling a die and that's a zero. I take it. Then we are rolling for Tila and that's one soldier. Yeah, I don't know. I think we can remove one down here. It doesn't really matter. And then we are rolling for Stratos and that's also a zero. So I was paranoid for no reason, but there are also double successes on these. And I believe they do count as double successes. Basically, when we are talking about removing those soldiers. Yeah, nice. Next, we will gain our income because we are starting here on a basically a new day. So let's count all those Eternium symbols. One, two, three, four. Of course, we have to control them. So here's five, we are getting one back. So we are at least now having some money. It's really important for Stratus's ability, maybe also to choose encounters, but I think we really need to start purchasing some stuff. Sooner or later, it's getting time to go after these quests, right? And he's in an okay shape to go there. But in order to do that, I want to start with Tila. So we could go, oh, that's an interesting one. We could go for an outpost movement now because again, these are connected and we are controlling them both. So for one movement point, we can basically move two spaces. And from there, we could maybe move in here and take a wild action with her next, but then she would be also a Jace. I think that's pretty good, actually. And then we might be able to buy him something just to try stuff. We have the counterattack spell. No, I think we are in okay shape. So let's do that. So we are starting with Tila. For her first action, she will... Ah, no, she only has one movement point. That's, I think, the main question that is getting raised on the geek. Even though there are two different actions, the outpost and the move action, we still only have one movement point for her. That's all the more reason getting a beast. Basically, you can tame these beasts or getting a vehicle because I think these vehicles always give you at least one more movement points as far as I know. So no, I think this doesn't help them. Having her lingering at Faux Castle doesn't help there either, but I still, yeah, in this case, it doesn't matter too much. Or maybe it might, it might. So let's have a move up here again. 
and there she will brave the wild and I think we are not going to spend a coin we need the money we need to buy stuff because we will definitely sp are we spending more money now we could actually it might be worth it spending some more money actually to move stratus into village of orcas which would be another merchant for equipment and again if we are controlling two merchants we are getting a discount of one per item we are buying. If you would be controlling three merchants, we would get a two discount, but I think that's not going to happen anytime soon, actually. Let's not spend the money for these encounters for Tila. Let's see what we get, and it's an ally. Many faces. Oh, that's so cool, actually. And it's an ally for our faction. Otherwise, we would have to fight him now in a wilds encounter. But in this case, we don't need to do that. The only question is, why do we have the two money up here? Because this is typically the money you have to spend for taming these folks. But I thought you can't tame those allies, actually. But yeah, it's really an ally for us, which means we don't need to fight him of or so. That's very similar to um, Star Wars Talisman, for example, or the Harry Potter Talisman. If you find someone from your side, you get to keep him. If it's someone from the other side, yeah, you have to fight them. Okay, okay, I checked the rules because I wasn't really unsure. No, if he is an ally, you still need to spend the Eternium in order to get him. If you don't want him or them, uh, or you can't afford them, you can shuffle them back into the encounter, but then you would gain one coin for that. The thing is, when we get him, we would also get an additional combat card, or not an additional, we would be able to upgrade a combat card, replacing a one with a plus two. That's amazing, that's really amazing. And his ability at the beginning of each epic combat round roll two dice oh wow mm, if we are successful we are gaining one more initiative and initiative can be so so important yeah um i think we want to spend the money here actually so we are spending two getting three back we still have some money left actually i think we want to give this then to men at arms we are also grabbing ourselves where is our combat deck here we're getting ourselves a plus two and again are we placing this with a plus one from our deck so wow we already have upgraded two cards and we haven't even fought a single time uh not sure if this will actually happen during this episode so sorry for any disappointments i was kind of hoping at least for a wilds combat because that's a different uh, mode of combat but i think that's still a very very valuable turn for her nice we are not going to buy any equipment for her because I want to prep him actually to go after this. So he's moving in here and he's also braving the wild. And because I'm really thinking about getting this plate armor, mm, but then I can't move Stratos. Okay, uh, uh, no, that's a gear, right? Oh no, okay, okay, let's take things back. Let's take things back. I believe if we up, yeah, yeah, of course, we will activate Stratos first. Yes, we will spend one coin in order to activate his flight ability. So he's moving one, two spaces. On the other hand, let's do things a little bit differently. Um, he's first of all he will activate before he's moving in sports spending he will use the mobilize action and he will send two soldiers up here there are no other soldiers which means we are not fighting there and they can move over these outpost lines without controlling both regions and this space will still give me one eternium but it takes another round until this happens but i think that's still worth it and now we do the move with stratos we already spent the money one and two so now we are controlling two merchants with the equipment right yeah equipment icon here which means we are getting a discount of one which would then exactly be enough to get the plate armor Nice, but that was basically the turns of Tila and Stratos. And then last but not least, we are following through our plan. We will move him here and then we will also brave the wilds. Uh, we are not 
going to pay the money so we will live with what we draw here and that is another event hopefully there are no goats let's see hopefully they're not stealing our money or so some villagers bandits some villagers approach you asking you to help them deal with bandits on the nearby road will you stop and help okay what do we need to do you may discard this card with no effect okay otherwise you enter wilds combat with the bandits oh we get a plus three yeah, I think that's a no-brainer. Getting another plus three cards now. That is amazing. And we can I can show you a Wilds combat. That's at least something. Cool stuff. They have a 3-3 three, three and a 3. And his body ability is a 7. Yes, exactly. So he's rolling 7 dice for this combat. But still, we need to come up with at least 6 successes in order to be successful. But I will explain you how this goes in a second. Yeah, let's set up for our first Wilds combat. Nice. So let's bring out my trusted dice tower here. So here are 3 dice, 4 dice, seven dice in total and keep in mind this is only one variant of the combat the epic combat is a completely different beast with those combat cards and whatnot but these wild combats are basically very streamlined very fast paced encounters and honestly they really mm, sweeten things up a little bit they make things um yeah pretty quick Let's put it like this. So we have to roll our dice. That's basically what happens. Okay, that's not a bad start. So these are two successes, three successes, four successes. Nice. These are re-rolls and they allow me to roll that die again plus another die of my choosing. Similarly here, so we basically get to re-roll all four of those they don't have any special abilities no they don't so let's simply roll them again and yeah i think this is i think it's really exactly enough so we are not even taking any damage whatsoever so the way how this works is we have to assign those successes now to these combat stats in order to defeat them we first have to go through their shields so let's do that first. One, two, and three, they have three shields. So they're basically zeroed out on shields. Then I think we want to defeat them. They have three um, hearts, so three life points, one, two, and three, so they are dead. Now, simultaneously, they would inflict three points of damage to us, but we have also three successes to counter that. So we are not taking any damage whatsoever and this allows us to gain a plus three card into our combat deck again we are removing another plus one we already have removed three one cards from our deck so our deck is already pretty heavy actually i like this one a lot so we might really have some good chances making it for uh, to this quest here oh yeah that's so cool nicely done great job man at arms but i think this is basically the end of his turn now we definitely want to spend the three remaining bucks we have to buy him the plate armor again we are getting a discount as we are controlling two of these merchants right now and this simply gives him a plus one shield which is really invaluable for, for these epic encounters great stuff great turn okay our enemies are still aren't doing anything but we are progressing through the game so we are entering another night phase at the end of each activation so we could heal with those heroes one life point that is and then we are only two more spaces away from our next event where we would have to roll two of these dice per hero and for each who says we are removing soldiers. So I think it's really time to get some more soldiers out as soon as possible. But I think for today, I will end my playthrough here just to make sure we have some room 
for you to chime in in respect to any goofs I may have made and most likely have made. I'm still not 100% sure if I'm playing these baddies here correctly or if I should be doing anything with them, but I don't think so. I think this is really all preparational work right now for me and I like it so far. And also give me some advice on whatever my playing style, should I be more aggressive, less aggressive, just let me know. Before I forget, a huge shout out to all of my patrons and channel members out there. You guys are amazing, really do appreciate Appreciate all your support. If you want to support my little channel here, you will find a link to my Patreon. Patreon, you can join me here directly on YouTube. You can click that little thanks button below the video, like and subscribe, leave a comment, everything helps. And yeah, with that being said, hope to see you soon in one of my other videos. And yeah, until then, bye bye.